I don't forget my USB stick, and that's about it. So I don't know what you guys think. Yeah, I, I think that's very true. Like there, there's not, especially like in our genre, it's like you have multiple rappers on that on a, and if you have one DJ all night, you really just need your two, two DIs on stage. So in terms of communicating with the uh, the venue ahead of time, DIs are like your inputs to get to the board. So other bands, they'll have like their drums, they'll have their guitar, they'll have all these other pieces that they have on stage. And then when the next band comes in, all of that's got to kind of change to a degree, right? We don't have that, so it's not quite as important. But I mean, communicating with the venue is super important and just telling them what you have going on, providing them with a, a copy of your poster, all those kinds of things are super important. But in terms of like the, the communicating with the sound guy, it's a little bit different. But you do much bigger shows, so maybe you have a different way to do that. Yeah, that's pretty much what I'm saying. I will say that when you're promoting shows and you have one DJ and a bunch of MCs, it's important to be super organized because you don't want one MC, like people to go over their set times. And then at the end of the night, one MC is left with hurt feelings because he doesn't get to perform or she doesn't get to perform. So I think there is value in like planning things well and doing it well in advance to make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, also note like, I managed to DJ for the last two years, and when the performances start to stack up, when you're doing like, I don't know, like tours with like 20 or 30 gigs, you do need to have all that stuff organized. The bigger promoters, they're gonna want you to advance shows three or four months ahead of time. They're gonna want all your flight itineraries. They're gonna want um, your stage plot and tech writer. They're gonna want the, the day of contact, so just in case there's problems at the venue, or you're running late that they can get a hold of you. So I think that I think we might be at a level where we don't need to advance as much now, but we should start to work towards that that way of doing things in preparation for those next steps. I think that's super important. And like having it all in one place too. Like we have a folder on Dropbox that we keep our stage plot and like contact info and logos and music and all of that stuff. And then you can just give that to your to whoever your contact is at the venue, right? Then they have everything in hand, and that's something you can do now. Like, even if you're not talking to a whole lot of venues, it's just great to have it all in one place so that when the venues do come, you're ready for them. I think uh, I think I've got shows in Europe in May, and we already did all that. So basically, yeah. advanced the, the the plot, um, basically when we're coming in, and all that sort of information um, is set up. But actually, just to get a rough idea. How many of you guys have uh, are booking your own shows? How many are like have a booking agent? How many have any promoters that they work with? So it's all DIY. Okay, there you go. So it's all DIY. And how many people have done a show outside of Winnipeg? Okay. So yeah, just to prepare you guys, I think the when you're working with an agent, they're going to attach your stage block and tech writer to the contract. So the promoter or festival has that in advance. They know what they need to provide. So that include all your backline listings. And that'll include um, uh, the input sometimes that'll identify the number of hotel rooms you need. The, like sometimes you ask for a three or four star hotel room. Um, it'll identify your hospitality rider. Because um, when you get to the next level, they like everything is a part of the show budget, and so they're sometimes they're going to be able to meet your demands. Sometimes they're going to come back and cross things out. And again, the basic tools at that level is having the stage plot and tech writer. Um, when you sign on with a booking agent, that's one of the main things they're going to ask for after the um, photography, the album release uh, plans, the marketing plans, and your tour uh, targets is the stage plot and tech writer. Um, so I think if you don't already have one, even if it's just you and a DJ, you need to figure out what that DJ is going to perform with. Um, you need to know the exact specifications and make some models of the turntables and mixtures they're going to use. Um, if they want a table for the turntable and mixer, you have to get at that much detail. Because I've, I've seen shows where people show up, oh, there's no table. Uh, well, we're a DJ, we need a table. I mean, you got to, that's got to be a part of your advancing emails or phone calls is saying, you know, we need a table. Also, if you're, you're playing with a live band or like even a percussionist or drummer, you're going to need to say that the, the what drum kit you want, you have to identify that you need a stool for the drum kit oftentimes, or else they'll show up, there'll be no stool and uh, your own breakable. So advancing is just a process of confirming all the details for your show um, 
couple of times um, before you actually get there. And, and like I said, when you get to those next levels, it is uh, a, a big job. Like I'd say, I spent I spent like ten hours on each performance just advancing, and that's just going back and forth with the mark or the promoter, going back and forth with the festival and the sound technicians to make sure everything is lined up. And that's just for a DJ. And that's not even with an MC. So I think there's a lot of expectations when you get to the next level. For our festival, we started already. So when you apply for the festival, it's literally in there and asking right off the bat. And any of the headliners that we're working with right now, we're already trying to find all that stuff out. And that's in June. So I mean, just as an idea of how much time it actually will take. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous. And I think when you work with the bigger festivals, like we did um, the Jazz Festival last summer, it was I think I had to communicate with like four or five different people just to advance the show. And so there's so many people involved with these bigger events that it can be overwhelming. And so you just got to be ready. Also note that I think, and this isn't industry standards, but I think like if you go into a booking agent and you have a manager, chances are they're going to give you a lower fee. Um, booking agents, I think, are taking 10 to 20% of your uh, gross performance fees. And so if you have a manager and they don't have to do as much work, I think they're going to give you uh, a rate on the lower end. Um, is that what you guys, you guys um, have that same experience or perspective maybe? Um, I don't work with a lot of managers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we, yeah, the hip hop community, not very many managers, not very many booking agents, all of the Yeah, that's kind of, that's yeah, kind of okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I think like, just my point again is like, we need to get ready for those next stages. Because I think like, you look at what happened with Drake in Toronto, like after he came up, there was just a trickle down effect for a number of MCs and a number of producers down there. And that's not to say that it can't happen here. And what we need to do, I think, as a community is just start to think that way. Just start to think, you know, who are the who are the people in my crew that can manage? Who are the people that, you know, can hook us up with with agents and who's gonna advance the shows in the future? Who's gonna handle like OVO even has like a full time photographer and that's why he doesn't just take photos. And so, I mean, you guys have this, have the potential to do that kind of stuff too. And I think we need to start thinking of that that way now. Well, how did you how did you become a manager? The, the, these people probably <laughs> want to know. <laughs> the, I became the manager because we needed somebody to be the organized person in the group, and then we needed a DJ. So those are the two things that I was like, oh, I could do that. <laughs> so uh, that's where I stepped in for that. And then I get we have dealt with booking agents like just very recently, and it was on the lower end of that scale that they were talking about. Like they took ten percent. Um, of the deal that we did. So maybe that's because I was involved. I don't know. Um, but that's what the offer was. And I was like, yeah, 10% sounds, sounds fair for what you're doing for us. You know what I mean? It was, it was worthwhile. Cool. So I've got in my notes here that we've got to talk about after the show. So we're, we're going to think about being in the venue, the performance is done, what happens at the end of the night? Get paid. <laughs> How do, how do you make sure that happens? <laughs> well, if you're running the door, then the money is yours, right? So make sure that you have somebody that you trust uh, at the door to handle all of that money. Uh, if you're getting paid from the venue, then you, that's a conversation. Sometimes an awkward conversation, but a conversation that has to get had realistically. Um, clean up, we tear down our own stuff. We put it all back where, where we got it from. Like that's all part of what we do too. Sticking around after your show, I think is very important. Just talking to people. Um, we've been known to get kicked out of Goodwill tons of times. The last one's out the door, but they're happy because we made the money, and, and so they're not that mad at us when we leave. But you, you got to hang around and just talk to the people that are there. Like if, whether you're going to shows or you're throwing shows, I think that's a super important part. Do you guys have a safety plan for like maybe you've done a really big night? You got like seven, eight thousand dollars of cash in your pocket. Yeah, we have the bully mom. <laughs> <laughs> we have a couple of guys that we trust very well, and they they're always around us. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, because I think that, that was always a big concern for me, like walking out of the pyramid at like three in the morning with eight or nine thousand dollars in my pocket. It was just, yeah, it was just <laughs> stressful. So, yeah. What about you? you guys have safety plans at all for the end of the night? I have like a, uh, I have a security guard that's like six five. The other <laughs> <laughs> so, that usually helps uh, scare anybody. But yeah. Is our security guard or security guard from the club or whatever. That's pretty much it. 
I used to be 250 pounds, so nobody really messed with me. But I will say, I will, I will say this much though: eight or nine thousand dollars after a show, like I'm thinking, like five hundred bucks, a thousand dollars, like yeah, that's a lot of money for like for for hip hop guys. Like in my head, I'm like, and I don't know, maybe you guys can let me know if I'm crazy here, but like hundred people a show, maybe two hundred people. Um, typically, and if you're, you know, ten dollars a head, and then all your expenses, you're like a thousand, fifteen hundred bucks, right? Yeah. And so you don't feel quite as pressured when you leave the venue. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice amount of money, but it's not like I got eight grand in my, you know, I got a hobby sitting in my pocket, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's a, another step. Like for me, I started out in the '90s, like I said, losing a lot of money, and then I learned how to like register a nonprofit. I learned how to uh, access public support for concerts. And then I learned how to make more money. And so I think like having, yeah, having bigger performers come in. And I think we have some, some promoters. I know the union was a big thing uh, that our coworker Ruben used to work at. And you know, they bring in Yellow Wolf, they bring in these big American acts and they pull lots of money out of those venues. And so I'm just, I'd like you guys again to think of the future and think of like, okay, we've got this big cat wad of cash in our pockets. People are gonna know how are we gonna get out of here safely at the end of the night? Maybe like we used to like kind of sneak money out at, at intervals of the night too, and um, just have people take it to the bank right away. So it, it was a concern for me. It stressed me out. Yeah, and like there'll come a point where you get paid in a check, and that's a little bit easier to to walk away with than just the lot of cash from the door. But another thing is like make sure you register yourself as a business too. It's not that expensive. It's great to do it now because like like uh, Alan's talking about the growth. There's gonna come a time where like maybe you're pushing that that money range to the top end of that, and you don't want to have to claim that as an individual, whether you're an individual or a group. Somebody's got to hold that. So it just makes sense to to start that business now, and it'll make you feel good. You got it. You can open a business account, and when you go to apply for funding, you're gonna need that later too. So that's something like if you don't have that now, I definitely recommend you go do that. Um, a lot of our sales like are online and stuff, so we don't have that much cash at the end of the night, but what cash we do then, that's when we pay the DJ, the photographer, and so on. Um, you can also talk to the bar and you know give them the money, and then they just write you a check as well if you don't feel confident walking out. But usually now, like I'm not sure if here, but in Vancouver, I'd say probably 70% of our sales are online now. That's great. So, and um, merchandise. What are you guys doing for merchandise and shows? Are people still buying T-shirts? Are people still buying CDs? Like, what are you guys doing for merch? We did a CD release, and we sold more shirts than we did CDs. So that kind of tells you where CDs are. That's why I'm making jokes. But I have a whole basement full of them. You want? <laughs> yeah, you know, I feel like vinyl, I feel like vinyl too. So it's not like that, but uh, yeah. But uh, I, I think merch is super important, and developing your merch. I think that's also an extension of your brand. And for hip hop, I think we get that more than many of the other ones. Like we're very into what we wear, what we put on ourselves, and how we brand ourselves. So I think that comes naturally for us. So I would definitely recommend merch. Just figure out what works. Uh, a big thing is like if you're gonna make shirts, guess what? There's a whole bunch of different sizes of shirts, right? So when you're paying for that upfront, that's gonna be kind of a pain because you don't know what size your fans are maybe when you start, right? But hats are one size fits all. So it's a good place to start. And as to, yeah, beanies, same thing, stickers, like anything that's like one thing, that's a good place for you to start. Um, that's that's what I recommend. Like the biggest thing that we've made money on, which is hilarious, is tapes. Like tapes have been the, the best thing for us. But there's that nostalgia factor, there's that proud to pay factor. And I think that's really important. Bandanas too. Yeah. Um, we do a lot of tours, bandanas, they're cheap. You can sell them for 10 bucks. So your profit margin is really huge. Stickers, you know, you go, you're doing shows in different towns, slap those stickers all around town. So. Yeah, profit margins are interesting. So I used to do CDs. My last album that came out was on Herbnet and it was vinyl. Um, and I did less, um, less of a run. And it's always kind of disheartening because as your physical sales keep dwindling, which is the nature of the business, I know that like back 10 years ago, I would do like um, press like a thousand CDs and sell like a thousand CDs at $10 a pop. And I mean, like that was actually a thing. And then you go to do vinyl and I press 300 and you know, and I'm like, 
<laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> and then it's like you're selling for like $25, $20. And so if you think about that, $320 bucks is 6000 And you're probably spending a couple grand to do that. So you're only making about four. And then on a CD, you're looking at about $5 a CD in, in, in your costs and stuff like that or what you're making. So it's like pretty comparable. So even if you're feeling like, oh my God, I went from 1,000 sales to 300, if you're smart about it, you can still make the same profit that you did previously. So it's not, it's you don't have to worry too, too much. But yeah, stickers, uh, bandanas I've sold before, which have made good money. USB sticks are, were actually awesome for a period of time because you could put anything on it. And it's an upsell. So I would be like, first off, they can use it later on. They can like take it and use it like for whatever they want. And it's constantly got your logo on it. So like say your bands or your you know your axe logo on it, they're constantly using it. They're going to use it in their day to day life, and then on top of that, they um, uh, you could what I did on one of my tours was um, I would be like okay, there's an album on here and it's a USB stick for ten dollars, but if you want all my music, just throw me another five bucks or ten bucks, and then like literally you you end up with a profit margin that's like fifty dollars. And all you're doing is transferring, you know, more songs on, more content onto it. So, so t-shirts are still it's good. What are you guys pricing t-shirts at? Uh, twenty-five bucks. Twenty-five bucks. Yeah. And like online or on at a show. Uh, bandanas. What are bandanas priced at? Ten bucks. Ten bucks. That's good. Um, so it seems like for a show you need somebody work the merch table. You need somebody work the door. Uh, you need a DJ who's going to stand there all night. Um, are you guys also hiring stage manager, or is like somebody part of the crew that's managing the stage at all? Uh, like I'm usually the DJ, so I'm that DJ who's standing on stage. So I end up being stage manager as well. Or like if you have somebody that's around, it's usually whoever's around. To be honest, yeah. it's like, yo, you, can you go make sure that person's ready? Great. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, yeah. I think that's a big part of it. And then giving them the signal, you got like one song left. Yeah. Um, I've been trying to train the MCs in Vancouver to show up and be on the side stage like half an hour be before the doors open and 15 minutes before you're set. And uh, yeah, usually I just get whoever's around to help me, uh, you know, stage manage and make sure yeah, everyone's right on time. It's important to be on time. And don't go over your set. <laughs> Speaking of beyond time, I'm trying to in Winnipeg stop with the like 11 o'clock show start and then you're on at 1 a.m. Like no one wants to do that anymore. Like I, when I was touring Europe, that was one of the things that I absolutely loved. And I think you got you. We we talked about it. Nine o'clock the show starts. Nine o'clock the show starts. Eleven o'clock she's done. People are going for coffee and they go home. It's amazing. Just treat it like that and stop trying to like, you know, oh, 10 more people are going to show up. You know what? Let them miss it then because they won't miss it next time. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, that kind of leads into a question I have about the younger audiences. So like, I, I'm, I'm in my late 30s now, uh, but when I was going out and stuff, like, I think it was really easy to get people to come to shows. The 18 to 25 year old age range, are they still going out to concert? Are they going to your DIY hip hop shows still, or is it different? Well, I'm 21, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm still out of these shows. Yeah, I think they're up to that. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I would say that's probably where our demographic lies, is right in that, that age range. The bulk of it, anyways, because those are realistically the people that are going out. You know what I mean? You might have fans that are consuming your music that are older, but they're at home. Right? They, they might not come out to a show, or they'll come out to the big show, and not every show. But don't treat them any different than the folks that come out to every show. What's the audience like in Vancouver? Is it still young, or is it uh, older, like... Uh... Well, it, it depends. Like, it, it's an upcoming show, like, performers that are just coming up. It's usually a younger crowd, 19 to, you know, 24, 25. But if it's, like, a big show, and it's a big headliner, you get, like, a lot of older people out um, but we do a lot of all ages shows too so we're starting to get that 13 to 17 18 when we do shows in Alberta like it's nice because their drinking age is 18 
So they have like a way bigger um, turnout for shows because you get the 18 year olds out too. So that's pretty good. What's it like with like that younger crowd? Like, do they buy merch? Do they like do they have disposable income? Yeah, they've been saying that their allowance for the month. <laughs> <laughs> so with the not all ages shows, you have to like promote that further in advance, or is it still kind of the same timelines that you would use for like a an eighteen plus show? I usually do. I usually would promote like a month in advance, but I usually get like friends, little brothers, or sisters, or you know, I'm in, I'm in my mid 30s so or my friends kids to uh you know hand out flyers around school you know help sell tickets stuff like that utilize you know the younger people <laughs> i think that it's uh, one of the things too to recognize is that hip-hop is actually aging itself as a genre of music so there are actually 30 year old listeners 40 year old listeners and stuff like that where there never actually used to be like 20 years ago 15 years ago or whatever like when i started doing music um like yeah, I think some of the oldest people in it were like 40, and that's just generally how it is. Like, Dr. Dre is like 50 something now, so. Yeah, well, that's kind of where, where I was thinking because you, you mentioned you like to be home early or do early shows and stuff. And I'm just wondering if the aud younger audiences like early shows as much as I do as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't think they do, though. Yeah. Like, I think they want to be out till 2 a.m. Like, that's the deck. Like, I want to be home at 11, too, though. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. how do we make this happen? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I think the next uh, topic we're going to talk about is, is we've talked talk a bit about festivals, but um, I want to get some idea of what are the festivals that you guys have worked with in the past that maybe our audience could uh, follow in your footsteps and, and approach. Let's talk about Cat Canadian festivals. Okay. How many of you guys have done a festival before? Awesome. And um, Canadian Music Week, North by Northeast, South by Southwest, and they're mostly all Canadian festivals that you guys have done? Okay. So the reason why we started Northern Touch Music Festival is because I've been to a lot of those. Canadian Music Week, North by Northeast, South by Southwest, Indie Week, Coca Conference. I've done... Um, uh, no, I actually haven't done Rigo West, but you guys have. And what I found is that uh, they weren't extremely helpful for the genre. Uh, hip hop, R&B, and soul usually end up um, kind of pushed to the side, and uh, there aren't a lot of festivals for hip hop, R&B, and soul in Canada. Even if you're a music fan, uh, I know that Timber just announced theirs in, on the West, I think, and then there's like maybe OVO Fest and Manifesto uh, in Toronto. But those really don't generally actually help to um, any professional development or anything like that. And so that's why we stepped in and started to try and change that. But it's good to go to those festivals. Um, I believe that we're going to be a, a breeding ground to help artists bridge themselves to be taken even more seriously when they get to CMW and stuff like that. Because I don't know if you can speak on your showcases, but when I went to showcases, I was not, like, I remember going South by Southwest with lights. Nobody cared about my act. They wanted to see lights. Like, it was just the way it was, um, especially for hip hop and CMW, the bigger bands. There are like 600 bands that, that perform at North by Northeast and, and, and CMW and stuff. And we're talking cross genres. So they want to go, they're going to, all those labels and all those people are there for those top 10 bands. So we're trying to change that because I believe that there's enough hip hop acts here in the city and across Canada that can get a little bit of shine. And we're going to bring those people down, the delegates that actually matter. I remember being, um, I was just talking about Our Lady Pieces manager. I was learning a lot in, in the panels from Our Lady Pieces manager, tour manager at the time. But in a group of 200 people, if I handed my business card to him and said, hey, I'm a hip hop act from Winnipeg, he's never going to call me. So we've, we, Chase touched on Timber, OVO Fest, and Manifesto. Are there any other festivals that are booking hip hop acts? Yeah, like there, for us, like we did, we did go to those, and uh, like we learned a lot of lessons. So that's why I think that with Shay starting uh, the Northern Touch Festival here, if you guys haven't applied for it, the application still. Yeah, March thirty first. March thirty first. So if you haven't applied, I definitely recommend you apply because you're going to learn a lesson, right? Like everything you do in this, in this business, you're gonna you're gonna do something, you're gonna probably suck at it the first time, you're gonna fail at it the first time. You gotta take that 
L, you got to take that lesson and apply it to what you do next. So if it's right here at home and you don't have to pay to go somewhere to learn that lesson, that's going to be great, right? And then the other thing, <laughs> the other thing too is like there are festivals that are right in our backyard that you can go to, and they may not be uh, hip hop specific, but they booked us. You know what I mean? So if they booked us, that means they'll book you, right? So what are those festivals? Uh, we're talking about uh, Rainbow Trout Festival, which is probably one of our favorite. Um, Real Love Festival, which is fantastic as well. They're just kind of getting going, and there that's a great festival. Um, of course, we got Nuit Blanche in the city, which isn't quite a festival, but like it still has that vibe to it, and it's a good place to cut your teeth and play with different acts. And that's like the one way we've been able to find success in a in a city that's very much focused on indie rock and, and all of that kind of thing. It's just to get on those bills with those people, right? Play with them and just show them, yo, hip hop is still dope. Like, and the the thing is, the people at those shows, they're they're music fans, right? So if you're bringing good music to the table, they're going to be excited to see you as well. So I think that's kind of how you can cut your teeth and how you can get like some traction here at home. Are there any other festivals that you guys have done? Uh, well, we've done the Breakout West. Breakout West is fantastic for us. Like in, in terms of a, a showcase, which is like once you get to a showcase, you can apply for some funding. They, they gave us a little bit of bread to go out to Edmonton where they were having it. And that's an experience, right? Like when you get to leave your city and you're getting paid essentially, not paid, but like you have money to do that. And that's gonna feel good, right? Like that's one of those wins that like helps you keep going when you take a lot of L's in this business, right? But in Breakout West, we met a lot of people because of the, the showcases that we did and the people that we met, we were able to go out to Europe and now we're going out to Europe with Shay and them because of Breakout West. So like there are success stories that exist in these festivals. Breakout West is a great one as compared to like the Canadian music week because it's much smaller, it's much more focused. So there's a lot of people there and maybe more people at your showcase that'll pay attention. Yeah. In BC, we only have, I think, two festivals where up and coming artists can um, apply. Uh, Electric Love is one. They've been around for four years. Um, we're taking submissions, I think, till the end of the month. So you guys should all jump on that. Um, as well as a festival outside Kelowna Curiosity Festival. Um, this is the first year that they're doing. Um, a hip hop stage. So uh, we're also looking for what um, kind of fees can these folks maybe expect when they're uh, approaching these festivals, and what should they be asking for? We won't talk. Don't not touching on like the showcase events. Talking about like the, the paid music festivals. Uh, like what? What do you expect to pay for to submit? No, what should you expect to be paid to perform there? Uh, I guess it, it depends on a on a case by case basis. Like Rainbow Trout, they say it right up front: you're gonna get paid 200 bucks. That's, you get paid 50 dollars per person, uh, up to a maximum of 200 dollars. Um, we've done it a couple years, and maybe that's less than what we would be getting if we we're booking a show. But the experience is worth that 100 percent. Like I'm not mad at that at all. That's just 200 bucks. We get to buy groceries with. Like that's the way I look at it, and then you flip the groceries into a good weekend. Uh, I think when I think the biggest, the some of the bigger paychecks that I've got for festival stuff was um, about fifteen hundred dollars. I think around there, fifteen hundred, two thousand uh, dollars. We did the Great Cup, and uh, we got paid two thousand dollars for that. Um, so yeah, you can kind of expect. That's sort of the range, I would think, for some of the bigger, bigger festivals. Uh, Juno Fest is just around the corner. What kind of fees do you think? Uh, what kind of fees does Juno Fest offer? You probably have better idea than I. <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know the person. Just probably, that judge. <laughs> yeah, it's probably the same as the Great Cup Festival, I imagine. A couple of grand. A couple, couple of grand. Well, yeah. But there is a difference between showcasing and. Actually, performing as well. Yeah. I think Juno Fest is a paid event. It's not really a showcase um, like CMW or. Because I've submitted to actually perform it before, yeah. and I think there's still admin fees for the submission process. Yeah, I think there's thirty-five dollars I think to submit. I, I can't recall to be honest, um, but I, I think we should define what a showcase is. So we've talked about performances. Performances are paid performances in front of audiences. That pay to pay to see you. Showcases are performances you do for free 
with the idea of, of winning over people for your team or, or getting performances at festivals or concert halls, right? Yeah, I want to kind of speak on that because there's a lot in the hip hop community. I've seen a lot of things called showcases. And there are a lot of things being like, yeah, yeah, submit, you know, submit to play and stuff like that. Find out like what the format is and who's going to be there because there is a lot of dream sellers in that world. Showcasing, there should be delegates there. Go and look from last year. Last year we had a uh, X Funk volume. Uh, Dame Ritter, we had like uh, uh, the lady who runs like social media for like some 41 or lady piece in a lot of the majors. She was working in Coalition and now she works at Reach. Vanessa, she's awesome. Um, there were people that we had. We had somebody from Atlantic, New York. We literally were make, make sure that if you're submitting to these festivals, that they're providing some sort of, or showcases, quote unquote, that they're providing you with some sort of names or tangible people, um, just because there are people out there that are trying to shark you, and that's just no good. Um, showcasing can be really, really, really good. It can also be expensive. I've found that going out to some of the ones like CMW, and no, not to knock other festivals, it's just how it is for hip hop artists. You pay a lot of money to go out there, and then you end up performing for like 30, 40 people. And unless you're like the newest, craziest band that everybody wants to see, then some of those people aren't out there. So, um, and, and, they, and the labels aren't really, you know, necessarily knocking down the door to come and see you. So just make sure that you're developing good relationships. If you are applying for festivals, that they have some sort of proof of past delegates or something like that. And usually the $20, like in our case, the $20 is to partially sift out people who aren't um taking their career like seriously because you'll get anybody that submits for free um and then also because it takes a lot of time to go through a lot of submissions so yeah like in, in terms of uh what was the original question like what, what were we trying to just say? define what a showcase is oh, okay so so a showcase is like one of the if you look on factor they'll have a list of the ones they fund so that's a good place to start because then you can if you're registered with factor which you should be you can uh, go there and look at what these festivals are. That's the Breakout West, the Canadian Music Weeks. And it's like Shay said, they'll have delegates there. So there's teaching component during the day. So make sure you do that. That was one of the things I slipped on on the first day. It's like, I didn't have my day planned out. So if you're going to one of those, make sure that you know what you're doing, when you're doing it, because there's gonna be things that happen at the same time, you know? So that's an important one. And then again, like with Shay being here, it's a good place to learn those lessons right here at home. Because like you said, it is expensive to go out there. But the way we justified it when we went to Toronto for the first time was like, okay, we're going to Toronto. Who do we know in Toronto? Who does he know in Toronto? Who does he know in Toronto, right? And then make those contacts. And like you guys here especially were a great resource for some of that. Like, who can we talk to while we're out there, right? We got to connect with the Remix Project while we're out there. So while there might have been like the 30 friends that we knew in Toronto at our show, which like, that's not what you want when you go to a showcase necessarily, but it was great that your friends get to see you you still get these other opportunities while you're there. So we just looked at it as like, we got uh, factor whatever public funding to help us get out here so we can make these contacts. And that's maybe the way you need to look at it for the first few until you become one of those acts that like cats want to go see and you're on that featured bill. So I think that's important. And like, just look look out there to see what it is. There, there's a, who does Canadian Music Week use to accept all the applications? Sonic. Sonic Bits. Sonic Bits, yeah, so that's one. So there's all types of festivals across Canada that you can fly through. Sonic Bits. A A3C stuff. is a big hip hop festival in Atlanta. They only accept submissions through Sonic Bits as well. So, I mean, there's there's a lot of politics or I guess controversy around Sonic Bits, but um, I mean, those are the two access points right now for A3C and uh, Canadian Music Week. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it wasn't yeah. going to be a I think a lot of them, and to be honest, yeah, you see a lot of like bad reviews and stuff online and people being like, you know, mad at Sonic Goods and stuff. But I'll tell you right now, from my experience, I think I've been booked like all, all most of my festivals have been through Sonic Goods, so I have nothing bad to say about them. But uh, if you don't get into a festival, just keep trying. And I'll say that there, I think you touched on a great point. Like getting a showcase at one of these events is just your access point. And it shouldn't be like all your hopes and dreams go into that one performance. You definitely need to do some homework. I usually do like four weeks out. I go through the delegate list and start emailing people and calling people to set up meetings. Meetings are how you get the, the stuff done at these events. It's the one-on-one -on -one meetings. It's 
buying people beers, buying people dinner, and uh, you know making friends. And I think what your real goal in the music industry is 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 not who you know. It's about who knows you and who's going to re reply to your emails, who's going to reply to your text messages, and who's going to put support behind you when you're in their city. And I think that's what these events can do. They're just networking, really, and that showcases your access point. So do a great show, but I mean, like, put most of your effort into setting up meetings and being busy the whole time you're there. Yeah, most of them have that one-on-one, -on -one, so make sure you take the time to do research. Meet with the people that make sense to you, you know what I mean? Don't meet with the dude from Europe who does, like, heavy metal bands, and that's all he does. That's, that's not good for you. Look for the person who's going to maybe help your career. And then don't go there with like asking for something like you want something right now. Just go there to, to make a friend, make make that first initial contact and like hang out at the bar, that the hotel, like where everybody's staying is at. Because maybe you'll just meet somebody that might help you who knows this person, who knows that person. Like I think that's super important. Yeah, and I was just like, my my cold call is just like I just want to put a face to a name. I'm familiar with what you're doing, I'm really a big fan of what you're doing. Do you have like 15, 20 minutes to just grab a beer or, or grab a coffee well, during the, the, the event? And I think that goes a long way. Just, just being humble and, and asking people to take a bit of time out of their schedule for you. So yeah, um, that was festivals and um, showcase events. Do you guys have any questions about these? Like we listed a couple, but the festival world in Canada is huge. And um, it definitely supports folk, definitely supports country, definitely supports rock, definitely supports DJ, like electronic music. <clears throat> Doesn't really support hip hop. Um, is there any, yeah, question? Uh, for the festivals, are they just looking at like numbers, like how many people they think you can bring in? Or is it like based on something other than that? or? Uh, okay, so I think that I think that a lot of the festivals that I got into were because they were accepting a few, like they were like, which hip hop back can we accept? You know, basically, um, they weren't really catering to it. For our festival, we catered to hip hop, R&B, and soul. So I totally recommend everybody go and, and, and uh, apply. Our submissions, we look at everything. We we get that we're the ground level for a lot of artists. We get that we're going to be there to develop the skills required to go and hit up CMW later on and to like build those things. So, and I've even said to acts that have been here for a long time that are like veterans, like I'm not performing at the festival because I believe in the platform and any, any of the vets that are in the city, I say apply to the festival, just apply because we want to build that incubator and, and make it grow. So we look at everyone from somebody that's got like a cell phone video of like them spitting like hot bars. Like if you got that, we're gonna be we're gonna be doing some work with uh, a team video team from Toronto this year that's gonna be coming out and there's gonna be the uh, uh, opportunity for artists to be able to uh, be in a team backpack cipher. So we're we're basically looking at everything. I think that like if you're looking for um, kind of some of the like best slots because that's kind of what we'll be doing is kind of ranking like okay how, how much I would look at everything how many video views the the hits on your on your, on your SoundCloud uh, how put together your social media is uh, we'll be looking at your social media presence how active are you on social media um, things that you've done in the past shows that you've been booked on um, if you've been booked on bigger shows recently, then that'll be something to look at. If you've been touring, basically there's a huge checklist, and we're following uh, similar to what you know Factor and some of the other uh, companies would, would be looking for. There is no one specific thing that I would say, but it's all of it. I think uh, like some some of the ones like if you apply for South by Southwest, they ask you they ask for uh, like what kind of media have you been covered in, which I think is a very kind of poignant question because that's how, that kind of shows to them, especially if they're not in your city. What, what noise are you making in your city, right? So if you're not pursuing those things, maybe you should be. And I think that's going to be what a lot of these people are. Like, have I heard your name before? Especially when you're talking about some of these local and in some place. Like, are you doing shows? Have I heard your name before? And then, of course, like, what is the music that you've submitted sound like? Because a lot of them, you pick one song. So make sure that it's not something you recorded in your basement with, you know, your USB mic last night. Make sure that it's something that sounds great when you submit it, right? 
So, and just to back it up even further, most festivals have um, full-time paid people that are artistic directors, and so you, it's hard to find them oftentimes. You can't just go to the, the, the festival's website and, and search their contact directory, and it's going to give you their name, email, and phone number. They, they keep that pretty private because they're inundated every day with pitches from artists. And so I'll just, on that note, I'll say good music matters the most. And um, like the metrics and the team members, they'll all catch up as long as you have good music. Um, but getting in front of those artistic directors is key. And so what you're going to look at, like Breakout West, they're going to have some artistic directors there from Western Canada and overseas. So, I mean, if you want to perform at their events, getting them to come and see you perform at Breakout West is a good first step. Um, but again, a lot of organization, or a lot of festivals have um, submissions that you can submit your work to be considered. I think a lot of the bigger festivals will pick maybe uh, two percent of their acts from that list of submissions. And so, you, just putting your hat or your foot forward and asking them to consider you is is prob is is the entry point. But really, what you want to do is. Is, is make great music and have them come to you. These artistic directors, um, they curate, they, they put, put, put lineups together that they, that they love and they want to share with their audiences and they want to share with other artistic directors. And so I think it's, it's really about winning them over. And you do that with, and I, I, this is just my personal theory, is that a lot of the artistic directors are older and so they're on Facebook every day at least when I log in, they're always there, like the ones that I'm friends with. And so Facebook is valuable because you're getting your message in front of them. And they're going to look at your Facebook page, even though your audience probably won't. And they're going to see what's happening. They're going to see what, what tools that you have that they can use to sell your performances to their audiences. So I think it's still important to invest in Facebook just because the artistic directors are there. For us, we have a committee. Last year, we had nine people. Uh, I'm I am not part of that committee, so I could not help you get on the stage. I was I'm arm's length away from that. I can definitely like talk to people and say I heard this act or whatever. But um, essentially, we keep it pretty close. We just want to have everybody from each community, from each background, basically, so that we know that we're doing our due diligence. That it's just not like one person who's got all of the power. And literally, it's like, oh, that's my friend Jack, and I want him to go through. We don't want that to happen in our festival at all. And I think there's there's a distinction to make here between like what you can do in ticketed sales and what you can get away with, uh, or what I think. We just uh, to backtrack, we're living in a very sensitive kind of community right now in, in music specifically, and a lot of the festivals aren't looking to book acts that are you know have profanity in the language misogynistic lyrics um, and so I think like if you're looking at booking festivals it's it's important to have content that isn't offensive that isn't going to offend any part of their audiences especially if they're public, if they're receiving uh, government funding um, so I think for hip-hop that can be challenging because I think expression and uh, freedom of speech is extremely important but um, I mean that can limit your options at the, in the festival world for electric love um that's what we're actually working on this year, is uh, the content of the artists, uh, because now we're gearing more to it being family friendly. So, um, but we look when we pick the artists, like we have three days um, of hip hop uh, showcases. So we're looking for a lot of artists this year. We're looking for anywhere from up and comers to you know people that when we put their name on the poster, they're going to draw a hundred, two hundred bags. So, um, but we're also looking for people from around Canada too, so it's not just BC. So it's really important to get those submissions in and, you know, maybe make different sets. One set that you can do at a festival and one that you can do, you know, when you can, in, when it's a rap show and you can swear or do whatever, you know, and then have one for the festival. That's, a, that's definitely something that like, we've experienced. Uh, doing hip hop here in the city and like we definitely have curse words in some of our music but uh, we always make clean versions of all of our music so we have it for radio play of course and then uh, like we played at a, at a car, there was like a car dealership 
You know, I mean, those little kids dance around. So, like, I, I, I don't feel comfortable dressing in front of them. So it became that we're going to censor ourselves on the fly. And that became something that we were capable of doing. And it came to it came to our aid when, like, we played Jazz Fest last year. They booked us inside of a venue. And, and then, you know, they, they asked, hey, like, are you guys... Like, you guys are able to do clean sets? I didn't know that because we did Canada Day out on a boat and we did a clean set. So you, I think you need that flexibility within yourself. And maybe that's just self-editing yourself, right? Like, that's what we do. It's not three feet if you're fucking with us. It's three feet if you're rocking with us when we yeah. do a clean set. You know what I mean? So yeah, I always, had accessible. Clean, always had a clean set as well. And then our festival, um, we actually are very much interested in what you're talking about. Um, we are... Uh, we are basically gender friendly. Uh, inclusivity is very important. We have uh, somebody that represents the LGBTQIA community. They're on the board. So if you're, you know, dropping a bunch of f words and stuff like that, and like basically like talking disrespectful about somebody, the that committee is probably not going to be as interested. That being said, if you're all about like swearing and party and get lit and that sort of thing. That doesn't mean we're not going to accept you. It just means that you might be in the after party at like 12 o'clock, you know, or 11.30 at night or whatever, 1 o'clock in the morning. There will be a spot for you, but just keep in mind the audience that you want to perform for. If you want to perform at the Cube this year, which is where we're doing a festival, then keep in mind that, like, yeah, families are going to be walking around. You know, we've only got an hour from 11 to midnight that's, like, kind of the later stuff. So just keep in mind some of that stuff. I don't really know when we're supposed to end this, but I think we're getting close to the end. <laughs> um, you guys have any questions, follow-up questions about the festivals? I, I don't Why? want to discourage <laughs> you from when, making about, great music. When do they typically like take a like when's a good time to apply? Because I know for this summer, yeah, maybe just talk about like when times are to apply. Is it rolling deadlines, things like that? I, we're, we're, our deadline closes March 31st, um, and that's for June 29th to July 1st. Um, you, typically, it's above that. Right now. Yeah, it's like beginning of the year. But like a good thing to do, too, is like if you miss some this year, just put it in your calendar for next year like to, to check for it next year. Or build like a spreadsheet that has those all in there so that you know like when at least to be looking for them. You know what I mean? Because those days will always kind of shift. Yeah, like I think most festivals are announcing in February and March. And so that means that they've got everybody contracted by the end of December. And so to get into the good fee schedule, like the higher fees, I think you really need to be receiving um, offers or making pitches in August and September to get into the festivals for the fall and summer. Like look at announce dates and then like think three months or so back. Mm -hmm. You have a question? Yes, sir. So, uh, the the whole festival thing, um, what you just said there, Alan and uh, Anthony. Um, yeah, you. I just know from previous experience, uh, in terms of if you miss those deadlines, they're actually having conversations about your act and the money that's going to be doled out, like as in. For the summer, but in like November, late October, they're making their decisions. And if you're going to sneak in afterwards, your fee is going to go down. Um, you might have a chance still, like, to fit in something by December, but you're basically cut off after that, um, unless they really want you to be super excited or whatever. Um, the one thing, as a as a promoter that's also worked with a venue very close. Um, there's a few options that, and I know that some of you are getting to that point inside this room. Um, if you are working with a guarantee, if you are touring, uh, or if you're playing in the city, uh, I don't know if you guys work with this already, I know Shane, like, you've been around already too, but it's just, if you work with a guarantee and not just the door, and you know that that place is usually busy or you know you're hot at that moment, try and work with something that you can get on the back end. So the back end is just, if more people come through the door that's expected, you have something put in place that you're making like either, you can work out that it's a 3070 or 4060 or whatever it is of the extra money that's coming in, um, that's going into your pocket. Because sometimes that's just enough to get you in that door. 
um, for them to give you that more of a chance. And if you know you've got it, um, you'll get that money. Uh, the last thing I definitely want to point out is we didn't talk about sound check and all those wonderful things. Um, just be at sound check one time. Find out what it is. Um, talk to the sound person. The sound person is your best friend. You do not want to be up on stage and be like, put up the sound, put up my mic while the show is going on because the sound person will screw you over. Yeah, definitely. And that is a part of advancing. Um, yeah, having like advancing for me is the um, going over all the details, making sure that they have the most current. Uh, uh, version of the stage button tech writer, and then confirming the loading time, the sound check time, uh, when you have to be back on site, um, the, the set time, the set length, uh, who you're settling with at the end of the night, and uh, who's going to be counting in the merch, who's going to be counting out the merch, the, the merch split, um, if you're getting hotels, asking, uh, getting all the confirmation numbers, making sure that the the promoter of festival is paying for um, fees and uh, the room charges and taxes. Um, it's another thing to note that you're going to need a credit card when you go on the tour um, to check into hotel rooms, to, to book flights, and to book uh, rental vehicles, and to have, I don't know if you need a credit card for Uber, but it definitely helps. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a ton of details, and again, that's a part of advancing the show. It's super important. When you get to that next level to advance the show, because you're in, you're really in the customer service business, and if you're not replying to emails about advancing, they're not going to book you again. Um, everyone wants to work with people that are nice to work with and people that communicate well, and so uh, I think like you got to be ready. You have to have somebody on your team who's going to handle all the advancing if you're not going to do it on your own. And uh, after the show, plug it into SoCan. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure all those songs that you are going to play are registered to so bad. Then plug that. Yes, time. yes. I don't worry though. I still, I still have problems with it. I still like, but it's it's just a good habit to get into. Like, make sure you're submitting your stuff to SoCan and uh, anytime you're performing. Um, and and if you're not making money, another thing too is if you're not making a ton of money in a show, one thing that I will recommend is don't walk away empty-handed. Get everyone's email in the room. Build your mailing list. Find a way to bring get value so that you're constantly growing. Yeah, and and text too. Like get get people's uh, cell phone numbers and text them whenever you're in that, that city or whenever you have a show in Winnipeg. I think I've got a ton of phone numbers on my phone. I just different cities I can text people until I'm over here, and yeah, it definitely helps. Um, I think we had a question here and then here and here. Yeah, go ahead. Do you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're talking to me? I think oh, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I thought I was going to go there. Yeah, I'll go. Um, so for us, um, you know, we're, we're a newer group. So, uh, you know, if we're applying to a festival, per se, or even, you know, talking to uh, 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 someone who represents a club or somewhere where we might want to do a show, um, when we're sending those emails, and especially in our um, application in Northern Touch, we try to keep it very real and try to keep it ourselves in our co correspondence and how we're communicating with these people. Um, how important do you guys think it is to uh, be yourself, but also like balance that out with the say being very um, like business talk and proper, like, whoa, we're representing two above. And we would like, you know what I mean? Because sometimes I feel like as artists, you know, we really, we have very strong personalities, but it's like, I almost feel pressured to rein it back a little bit when we're talking with these higher up kind of people. So uh, how would you guys balance that? Uh, okay, so it's interesting because uh, as an artist, I've sat right where you are and I've heard two different viewpoints. Some people actually like it when there's the pretend manager or you make a fake email account and you're like, I represent blah, 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 blah. And it'll get you, um, it'll get you more bookings personally. I like to talk to the artists, and that's just a personal opinion. Um, but then I've also received uh, submissions on the website that say, why do you want to perform? Because we lit. <laughs> like, so you, you kind of you got to figure out like the balance there. 
Um, take yourself, like, you know, a little bit seriously. But do I think that you have to, like, blow smoke mirrors and, like, you know, whatever? I think that, the, the, to me, I think that's nonsense. Yeah, no, I, I, I've i heard stories of, of female acts in the city who have, like, created a, a, a male persona on a different email, and all of a sudden, you know, the, the offers or the conversation change. So I think that still exists in the city, which is unfortunate. Um, as you can see by my attire, I mean, my email game is pretty tight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, but there's still the, the, the just conversation. Just be respectful. You know what I mean? And, and know who you're talking to. You know? don't, don't be, just know the environment I think that you're dealing with. And then just bring the appropriate amount of that. Like, would you talk to your mother like that? <laughs> Not to put it like that, but like, you know what I mean? That's that same kind of idea, I would say. It's like, yo, I'm trying to do a show at your spot, yo. Like, maybe not so much. Like, I, I don't know. That, that meatloaf was lit. <laughs> <laughs> that, that being said, like, if you make incredible music, it's not going to matter how you communicate. Because somebody's going to manage you. Somebody's going to be your record label. Somebody's going to book your, be your booking agent. And they're going to handle all that professional correspondence for you. So I think like, yeah, I, like focus on music. Music matters the most. And so, I mean, I've, I've seen it with a tribe called Red. Like those guys aren't good at emails. They're not good at text, not good at communicating. Well, they have a manager, they have an agent, they have assistants that do all of that for them. And so it's about, I mean, making incredible music. And then you can skip all that. You can skip the, the button ups and the, yeah. and the slacks and dress shoes and stuff. So. The rappers are here, they're not but just the slacks. That's yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can skip this stage and just stick stick to jeans. <laughs> uh, question. Oh, I think you had a question first. Whichever. Um, yeah, I was just wondering about like you were saying about like how festivals and stuff wanting to see media coverage and how do you go about that, like with hiring a publicist or someone to really cover and document your shows and get it there? Like <laughs> is that a thing like how does that even come about, especially in Winnipeg? Publicists, uh, like I hate publicists. I haven't <laughs> done a good one. Uh, have you guys we haven't used one yet. So, like my thing to get, um, right? It, we're very much DIY. Like in case you haven't noticed, yeah, that's been the theme of the evening. But uh, my thing is like do something that's going to create a story. You know what I mean? Just just putting out an album is not a story, right? Like uh, one of the things we got coverage for for the Metro and for CBC. Uh, and that's one of those things where, like, when you get one, you probably will get the other because they're just kind of following, and it's a slow news there, whatever it is, right? So we we came up with an idea that we're gonna put instead of releasing a mixtape, we released all of our videos on VHS on a TV in a in a diner, right? It's a weird thing to do, and, but it's a story, right? It's just something that somebody wants to, to talk about. So we we did that, but the idea isn't enough. You still have to put that in writing in a pitch. And, and then, so you can easily Google like uh, how, how to do that. Those, those templates exist. And you just put your most important information, who, what, why, where up top. And as long as you do that and you give them the story right there in front of them, they're probably gonna cover you. I spe like it's unfortunate that we lost uh, an outlet like the Metro because they were a bit more accessible. And that's, to me, in my opinion, they covered us, then CDC picked it up, right? So I, I think that helps. But same thing goes with all these uh, college, papers and stuff that we had. I think doing something there just makes a difference. And then maybe somebody at uh, Free Press will see it or whatever, right? But making sure you do those those uh, press releases yourself at the beginning, it's, it's not hard to do. It just takes a little bit of time of just sitting down and writing it all. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be in writing. Yeah, and I think you can build your own databases. Like Hype Machine still lists all the hip hop blogs, and then most of the blogs have either, either submission forms or the emails that you can reach out to them directly. And so I think well, you got to build build from there. Publicists are just like any other member of your team. If you don't give them anything to work with, they're not going to give you any results. And so like if you don't give them a tour, they're not able to pitch you as a story to any of the publications in other cities. They're just going to hit national publications. They're gonna and they're gonna not. They're not going to have any traction anywhere else. And so you have to give them targets. You have to tell them where you want the stories done, the interviews, reviews. You have to give them photos and videos, biographies, websites. You have to, have, you have to give them all the direction. You have to give them the, the release plan and the tour plan as well. And so, I mean, it, it takes there, a lot of work. There isn't a lot of hip hop publicists, I'll be honest with you. I've hired probably two or three in the past couple of years. 
they all look kind of like suck. And not them as publicists, they're probably great, but they just, there's not, there isn't somebody out there really that's farming these blogs and getting you onto these places. One of the things uh, that I've done recently, there's a free tool out there called SubmitHub. I don't know if anybody's heard of that, but uh, check out SubmitHub. It's pretty cool, actually. Um, you basically can go on there and it submits to a bunch of different places and sometimes you get a hit, um, sometimes you don't. Uh, there are a lot of places that are closing. Uh, some of the blogs online, um, I would say the ones that I have relationships with are a bit long term, um, basically just sending them music and just like face to like personal type of relationships. Um, I bypass doing the PR, um, but yeah, like either have a story that stands out or if not, then just like, you know, <laughs> Send, you know, send a bunch of emails. <laughs> it's a lot, but and, and when you do get like a media hit, work it hard. Yeah. Like make sure you get everybody you know to go and onto that yeah. page because they're watching how many page views each story gets, and that kind of momentum, that kind of story, also convinces editors to assign people to cover your act again. And that's the same with like concerts. So if you get booked by a promoter, work that concert hard because if you can sell like. Two or three hundred tickets, they're gonna book you again because you're a great partner to work with. That's really what you're you're building as partners or investors. And so I think like it's all like just getting that one opportunity is not enough. You need to get people to come, you get to, you need to get people to check out that site, you need to push it really hard. I think being creative too, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, recently I gave as a piece of advice to somebody who was trying to get booked in certain areas, Facebook ad manager is amazing. Um, if you want to get like somebody on the CBC to recognize you, like you can try and find like just go and hit everyone who listens to CBC music because somewhere in Facebook, somebody who works for CBC music will have CBC music in their about me section or something like that. And you can literally just target people with CBC and it will just like eventually they'll be like, why do I keep seeing this ad for this group or like whatever. Or if you get a do get a media hit or something like that. Go and put some money on it. Put a Facebook ad campaign just to get people to go to that little like blog, you know, posting or whatever. And not only good for that, but I think it's good for perception too, like outward perception yeah. of how you're doing. Because maybe that news person doesn't get it, but somebody sees it. You know what I mean? People are seeing. It. That's, so that that's all the game is, is about perception. Like you're getting your fees up higher and higher by building the perception that you're worth more. And you do that through media, you do that through professional communications unfortunately <laughs> and you do it through like um through through youtube views and, and spotify streams and everything just builds and so that you can go to that promoter the next time and say you know what we've got like 500 listeners um in in your market that, that's on our spotify artist account um we we can definitely you know sell two or three hundred tickets and uh, that's how you get your fees up, it's just that perception. You need to make it look like you're worth more than you actually are at the moment. I think it's a super important point because it's also like whatever you're doing, whether it's you're pitching yourself to a media, whether you're pitching yourself to a booker, it's not what's in it for you as the artist, it's what's in it for them. Like, don't forget that. Like, what are you gonna bring them, right? Are you gonna put, are you gonna put people in the venue? Are you gonna send them to the bar? That might matter to them, right? So think of that when you're when you're negotiating that that first deal. Same thing with the media. Like, what are you going to do to help them? And I think if you start from that point of view, whenever you're doing a pitch, it'll really help you. Yeah, yeah. Having the big like social media following following is pretty pretty key. I remember Tasha the Amazon was here last last time, and she said that even for Instagram, they have pods, or she has a pod, and so every time she posts something or somebody in her pod posts something. They like it immediately, so it drives the metrics up, and they get comments. Yeah, and comments, and so um, yeah, just working with your team or your community to build more momentum and a bit of a movement definitely helps. Yeah. Uh, you got a question? Uh, just going back to booking shows, because um, I'm an artist who who book shows and has other artists perform at, at the shows, and uh, one of the things is like the cost of like the rent or how much how much it's gonna cost me to put on everything and get like the DJ paid and like the artist paid and everything like that. What are some types of things that you guys do to like offset that cost, like to cover that cost uh, other than just like ticket sales? Well, you guys like, have, like sponsors or well, yeah, stuff like that? Absolutely, like that's, that's definitely an option. That's, that's definitely an option. 
is looking at that. But it, like if you're just getting started out, maybe that's not that option is not on the table yet. I think an important thing to do, like especially when you first started started out, is like I'm not gonna promise anybody any money because I don't know if I'm gonna make any money. You know what I mean? So yeah. that let's 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 split whatever we take home today. Yeah, I was gonna just say split it with the groups, split yeah. the expenses. You know what? Being transparent and being open with people is literally one of the best things ever. If you got four or five acts and you're just starting out, you guys don't know what to do. Literally say, let's split it all, because then you're then you're all working together. You're all in the risk together, and it's not you don't feel like you got the world on your shoulders. And on top of that, why even go to use a venue? I rock some basements with twenty people in it, and like yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah for sure, definitely like 20, 30 people. 10 bucks is 300 dollars and you literally just pay the dj you know 50 bucks even if you're performing for half an hour or something like that like start thinking of ways that like do you really need a venue or is that just feeding your own kind of like oh my god i'm on, like you know i'm on stage like you know what i mean like just start thinking of like creative ways to do stuff where you might not necessarily need that like some of the big shows yeah like that basement i think you were where you at that show with chris like when years and years and years ago we did a show or we were or a war on music. Uh, one of the first shows that Chris Bennett ever did um, was was a show. It was a launch for one of my Canadian tours, and um, literally we were in the basement of that place and we sold it out. It was no liquor in the venue. There was probably like two hundred people there. The water was like coming from the ceiling and broke and busted. And we were like worried about like everyone, you know, watch out for safety. But like, yeah, we were. It's like just be creative. Chelsea, you um, find any revenue at other than ticket sales? Um, sp yeah, sponsors is one. Um, there's crowdfunding too. You could get into crowdfunding. Um, you know, merch sales can help. Um, that's pretty much what you want. The uh, Mantle Arts Council also has a fund for festivals and concert series. And so if you're going to do a series, like a string of uh, events at XQs, might be something to look at. Like I think you can get between five thousand and fifteen thousand dollars in support, and so that won't cover. That shouldn't cover all of your expenses. That should just be a portion of it. And uh, I guess that kind of leads into a short discussion on funding, unless we have more questions. But yeah, like I would look into the Manitoba Arts Council right away. Um, there's also the sponsorship program at Factor with it. I'm sure that you guys are accessing. Um, and um, also tour grants. Um, Delio got a nice tour grant this summer. <laughs> yeah, definitely helps. Where, where did you get your tour grant from? Arts Council? Canada Council for the Arts, yes. I got a group one for 15,000. And I got a marketing grant uh, from Manitoba Film and Music. That was a shoot grant. So, yeah. Nice. And I wanted to speak on the public system, yeah. um, just to answer that. So it really is all about connections. Yeah. How I ended up getting a publicist for this project is they contacted me about getting on a show for Ilva. I don't know if anybody knows Ilva. She's a uh, Ilva artist on Toronto. So I, I was the opener for a show. We connected. Uh, and I worked with him on some other stuff. Um, he also does marketing. So I, I, I bought a marketing plan for him. So I always think it's important. Sometimes you got to put more money in people's pockets. They're more willing to answer you back. You know? When I send a message, he gets me back. Immediately, so I was telling him I was working on this project and needed a publicist. So he's like, "Okay, I have a publicist." He connected me with her, and that's essentially how I got my publicist for this. But all through connections, all through showing up. If I don't show up that show, or I come from work, I'm like, oh, "It's not really going to be a lot of people there. Like, who cares? I can shoot them a quick message. They want to see all the other cameras and blah blah blah." So I guess be committed to your commitments and then follow through. Yeah, definitely. Bad news travels a lot faster than good news, and so if you don't show up, you know. You cancel on stuff, people will find out right away. But also, like on to your point, like putting some money into his hands. Like I remember when Winnipeg Most was just starting out. Billy used to just come and get tickets from me. He he'd take like a hundred tickets and go and sell them and bring me back the cash. I was like, this is awesome. And so I mean, like I wanted to work with him like almost every every show we did. So I mean, like if you put that kind of hustle in, it's definitely going to go a long way to to helping the promoters or the festivals in your in your community. And um, those people will be champions for you. Like, I, I went and told everybody, this is how hard these guys are working. And then everything started, like, the music matters the most, obviously. They have great music. But, I mean, like, the more champions you can win over, the better it is. And the more people you have, like, talking about you and, 
and spreading the good word. So I think it's important to, you know, like you said, put some money into their hands or at least help out with the, with every part of the, the process. What's that? I said I missed those guys. I don't, they worked so hard. I remember I did a show with them at the West End, and it was sold out. And it was like all kids. They went downstairs, like right after the show, started like signing posters right away, and then came out. And there was like a lineup for an hour after the show. Like they worked super hard. When uh, I brought them to Prince George, and they ended up doing like booking off a little tour with them, just because I'm like, these guys are really big out here, and they're. Um, booking managers like who's this Winnipeg's most guy I'm like yeah. no like let's book him and she ended up like when we put out the show the whole like all of Canada was like hey we want to book these guys yeah, like it was they, pretty awesome. yeah their first tour was pretty huge yeah so. your friend is still around you just dropped the project yeah yeah, yeah. it's still here yeah. it's still here it's on cassette yo it's on cassette it's an alien yeah. too yeah uh, yeah, so I mean, like, good things can definitely happen from Winnipeg, and I mean, it's all about you guys just um, just working super hard, realizing that you know that promoter, that festival, that publicist, or that manager or agent is is one of your investors, and you got to show that investor that you're worth you're worth it, and you're gonna work just as hard as they do. Um, do we have any more questions? Yeah. You mentioned the booking agent. Is that for like Europe or Eastern Canada? Like, at what point did you decide that? Get you haven't decided. We're, we're not oh. with the booking agent. We just said that we've done an odd show with one. We'd like, they come to the table and be like, hey, we have this. Would okay. you guys be interested? Kind of thing. Okay. So, in that case, we, we dealt with them. But, like, it would be nice. I just don't know. Like, that's a conversation still to be had. Okay. So, I'll touch briefly on funding and then we're going to wrap, the, wrap things up. Uh, I mentioned Manitoba Arts Council for festivals and concerts. Um, if you do get to the point where you're registering a nonprofit, uh, like you guys, um, there's also the Can Canadian Arts Presentation Fund for our Indigenous or our Aboriginal Music Week. Uh, we usually get about thirty-five thousand dollars from them every year. Um, Canada Council also has support for music festivals and tours. Delio, like you said, he got fifteen thousand dollars from them for touring. Um, <coughs> when you do get to those minimums for um, SoundScan. Uh, you can access the Radio Star Maker Fund. I can't recall what the details are there, but I think they'll give you uh, additional money for every performance you have um, booked outside of your province. So let's say you're doing a Western Canadian tour, maybe, and I'd have to double check, maybe you get like an extra thousand dollars or fifteen thousand dollars or fifteen hundred dollars for every show, which definitely helps you because um, a lot of the festivals will give you performance fees and accommodations and meals, but they won't provide flights. And so um, it's something that uh, you're going to need to, to keep in mind when you're getting to that next level and booking shows with festivals. You're going to have to cover your own flights. And so the tour grants are important. Radio Star Maker is important. Festival uh, Factor is important. And um, like Anthony said, what's that? I said y'all got money here too. Right? We got a, yeah, a we got a showcase. <laughs> yeah, a little <laughs> showcase fund. Mark, I can't remember. Is it Market Access? Yeah. Market Access. So it's, it, it'll get you like one flight for, for getting out to a showcase. It's not a lot, but... I mean, helps every dollar. Yeah, every dollar helps. And if you do have the time to do all the admin work to stack up all these grants, it, it can cover a lot of the costs. But again, it's a lot of work. And um, the you also have to do reports for those. So it's, it's important to keep, to pay everybody. Uh, if you're going to pay in cash, get receipts for those cash, cash uh, payments. Factor won't accept um, receipts written out for cash payments. So you either have to pay them by check or by email transfer, because um, you do have to provide proof of payment for factor reporting. Um, so yeah, try not to work in cash too much, because um, you need to account for those expenses. And be very proud that you're in hip hop and you don't have a ton of backline. You literally can drive across this country in, a, in like a hatchback with like just a tank of gas and like think of four acts you know, and, and literally just like cold call a bunch of venues and say, hey, we just want to, you know, do a show there. We're coming through town. Four acts can split that and they can go from town to town. And you're looking at like, you know, all USB, one DJ with you and like four people to fill the time. Like you could do it. It's not, you know, don't wait for a grant necessarily to get out there on the road. So, yeah, that was a big one for us. Like we, we were, we had... We talked about funding to go out to Canadian Music Week, 
And then when the money didn't come through, like we were still prepared to go on our own. And I think that that's always important. Always be prepared to invest in yourself. And like one thing that we've always done that's worked for us is like we invest our, our money back into our art. And I think that's very important. Like, because then when you need to do something, you have that money there ready for you. So I think that's, that's a big one. And like Anthony said earlier, register a business. Yeah. I mean, everything that you do in music is a business expense. Even your clothes, even your Jordans, um, if they are part of your performance, that's a business expense. And so, yeah, for real, like, Word? yeah. <laughs> they will not insure it though, believe me. I actually went through insurance. My whole sneaker collection was stolen that I wear on stage and they did not cover me. The insurance did not, even though I tried to make that exact argument. So you need to keep receipts. And uh, the receipts will offset your revenue. And so that's your, your $15,000 touring grant. Um, that's right. In theory, that should be offset by all of those receipts you got from the road. And so you're not being taxed um, at the end of 2017 for a $15,000 uh, piece of revenue. And so register a business just so you can write, write things off. And like I said, it's, it's closed, but it's also like DJ equipment. It's also if, you get, if you're buying beats, or if you're paying for a publicist, if you're um, so, even coming to this workshop, you get a receipt for the workshop too. Yeah. So, I mean, that all counts it towards um, your business expenses. You can write that off. It's not like a real write off, it's kind of just it offsets the revenue. So, you pay less in taxes at the end of the year. But yeah, that's, that's why I have a business. Pay from someone else for a beer too. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> beers, like keep all the those receipts. If you're buying people meals, you can write off their portion of the meal, but not yours. And so again, the process for registering a business is two parts. The first is a business name uh, search in the company's office here at Manitoba, uh, Manitoba Company's office. And then once that name is approved, then you register that name. And then you get a business number. And then once you have the business number, you can take it to a bank and get a bank account for that for that business. That's like a hundred bucks or something. Yeah, that's so about a hundred bucks all in. Your artist name too can be a business name yeah. as well. Yeah, so in the business name search, you have to provide justification or a reason why you're registering that name. Yeah. And so it can't just be like McDonald's wrap or whatever. It needs to be something that's special and that isn't going to infringe on any existing copyrights. Um, that being said, I think that we're at the end of the conversation. Uh, let's have a round of applause for our panelists. Hey. <laughs> So I think we're going to um, just, uh, you guys can mingle for a bit, but I do have to get home because it's almost 9 o'clock. Got to get the kids to bed. But yeah, thank you all for coming.